All right, so now we're going to talk about chapter 12, static equilibrium and elasticity. Um, <clears throat> there's a big class of problems where you're talking about static equilibrium. And what that means is that you have no net force and no net torque on the system. So it is in equilibrium. And we, these problems all are in a class where you know that because you know that there's no net torque and no net force, you can solve the, um, the problem from there. So, okay, equilibrium. <clears throat> Often you are considering torque. Um, sometimes this is a little harder to see in these problems than if you are talking about um, about having no net force. Um, but think about if you were pushing on the system in a certain way, would you have rotation? And if you would have rotation, you have to consider consider the torque. Okay, so. Um, you've, you've already covered torque, so I don't need to go through this again, but you're considering you're going to have some force and R cross F applies a torque. You're going to have in, in, so you, in this case, you have a torque either pointing towards you or pointing away from you. Um, and some examples of applications are that uh, if you have a, uh, um, if you're considering whether or not a truck is going to um, tip over, then you have to consider whether or not there is a torque of the um, center of the um, of the torque about its center of mass. Okay. And it's also important to think about the center of mass or center of gravity of um, different objects. Often when you're considering the um, static equilibrium problems. So here, if you have um, the weight distributed between axles, you know that the um, you would have the center of mass slightly off center. Um, and that's where you're going to, um, it's going to feel like the force is, is mainly applied. Okay, so here, this is a free body diagram for the previous problem where you have the, um, the force, act, forces acting on the car. Um, so you have the weight acting as if it were entirely at the center of mass. And then you have two forces um, which are the reaction force of the road from the car. Um, and those two, um, those two forces are not equal. Um, so whatever the weight is, you're told that 52% that of the weight is on the front wheel and 48% of the weight is on the, um, is on the rear wheel. So you can view this as a static equilibrium problem um, where both of those forces are creating a torque about the center of mass. Um, and then you can, let me get my handy dandy pen. Um, and we're going to use red. Okay, so if you consider the torque about this axis, about the, of the front wheel, the moment arm is here. And then the R cross F is into the board. Um, so if we call, helps to draw our coordinate system, X, Y, and then Z would be out of the board. So then our first torque from the front wheel is equal to the length of the moment arm times 0.52 times the weight, all in the negative Z hat direction. Now, when we consider the rear wheel, 
this is our moment arm. So R, so the R, R cross F is in the positive Z hat direction. So the torque from that is going to be X times 0 0.48 times the weight. And this is equal to zero. So from, oh, and I forgot my X hat right here. So from this, I can say that negative D minus X times 0.52. The W's are going to cancel out because I have a W in every term and the Z hats are going to cancel out too because I have a Z hat in every term plus X times 0 0.48 is equal to zero. And now you can see that I have 0.52x plus 0.48x, which is 1. So I can rewrite this equation. Negative 0.52d plus x equals 0 or x equals 0.52 times d. Okay, so this all started with, I have a static equilibrium problem. I'm going to write out the net torque. In this case, the net force is trivially zero because if I look at the net force, I have the weight and then the reaction from, of the wheels from the weight. And so that trivially is equal to zero. There are problems where you might need to write out the net force. If you want to have a problem solving algorithm, start by writing out the net force and write out the net torque in a static equilibrium problem. They are both equal to zero. And then you can proceed from there to solve the equations. Okay. And you also could draw the, could solve this problem instead of rotating about the center of mass, you rotate about one wheel or the other. Because either way, the car is not rotating about that point. So it must be, um, there must be zero torque. Um, so because there's zero net torque, no matter where you rotate, it seemed like it maybe seemed like I had been especially clever in choosing the center of mass. No, there's no net torque about anything. So you can choose your point. Choose it in a way that makes the equations easy. Okay, here's another classical problem for static equilibrium. Um, you have uh, you have two strings that are um, that are holding something. In this case, you know that the net force on this is on this pan is zero. We're going to ignore the one of the strings finally snaps, but we can figure out what these tensions are. Um, so. Here, you would have to, you, well, I'm going to set this up, but not solve it all the way through because these problems can take a while. So I'm going to call this angle theta um, and you can figure out, um, you can figure out what that angle is using trigonometry. And then we can put in an X axis and a Y axis. Now here, 
it's probably easiest to look at it as I like to choose here you have a free body diagram you have zero net force on this particular point where you have an intersection um, and so your free body diagram on that particular point is going to be tension one tension two and the weight if you have as the book has it in a few examples a more complicated um, system of strings you can have one set of equations for each um, each vertex of the um, of the strings i called this tension one and this is tension two um, the lengths give you the geometry um, so that's where you get those angles and then you would break each vector into its components so tension one is going to be the magnitude of tension one um, and then a negative no sorry positive cosine theta in the x hat direction and uh it's also going to be a positive sine theta in the y hat direction um because the tension is pulling up and to the positive x direction and i could figure it out with trig but i'm just going to label that one y phi instead of theta and I do um, something similar for T2. T2 is equal to the magnitude of T2. Now I'm going to have a negative cosine phi x hat and a positive T2 sine phi y hat. You'll notice that I've been doing this for years. I still get tripped up on the subscript, so I'm correcting myself as I go. Um, the only thing that is the only difference between someone who has been doing this for years and someone who's beginning is that a novice is going to take longer to make to catch their mistakes it's not that they're not going to make those mistakes all right and finally my weight this one's the easy one is negative um negative the magnitude of the weight times y hat okay so then i have have my vector equations my vector equations give me two equations because i have two dimensions so my um, my two unknowns are T1 and T2. A general rule is that you need to have N equations to solve for N unknowns. So when I'm setting things up, I like to often double check that I actually have equations that make sense. Um, so my first equation is T1 cosine theta minus T2 cosine phi, these are the x coordinates, is equal to zero. My second equation is that T2 sine theta plus T2 sine phi, I sorry, this one should be T1 sine theta plus T2 sine phi um, minus omega, or sorry, minus w equals zero. These are the y components. Okay, so now my two unknowns are T1 and T2, and I have two equations, so I can solve them exactly. If I have three equations, I can, I have it over constrained, so I might have a redundant equation, in which case the problem can be solved, but it's also possible that I have a problem that is not solvable. All right then it becomes easy to say t1 equals t2 cosine phi over cosine theta 
and then I can plug this back in for T1 and get T2 cosine phi tan theta plus T2 sine phi equals W messy. I can solve for the weight in terms of the tension two. And then I can turn it back around and plug that in to get, the, to get tension one. So that's the basic procedure. Write out your net force or depending on the problem, your net torque. It helps if you write this meticulously as uh, with vector equations. And, and then you can um, break it into different components. Each different coordinate that you have is each different direction is going to give you one equation. Um, and then you have a system of equations and unknowns. And then you solve. It's easy to make stupid algebra mistakes. That's why I recommend working with a friend and cross checking. Okay, and here this is working through different approaches um, and how you can solve. Um, you can also do some of the geometry to figure out what angles those two are. Um, and you can also use your calculator. Um, but either way, you're going to set up a free body diagram. Of, even if you don't explicitly write it, think about it. Um, I would recommend, especially while you're learning, go through and write it very meticulously. All right, so here you have a torque balance. <sighs> you guys are probably young enough that you didn't actually have to use these. We had these in my um, high school science labs. They are, it's easier to make a cheap, accurate torque balance than a cheap digital scale that is accurate. So if you need an accurate scale, um, actually this might be a better approach. The other thing is that a digital scale is gonna need calibration and it's not necessarily gonna be as robust to the element. So let me put in a good word for analog equipment because it's often harder to break it. Um, and if you happen to do something out in the field and you suddenly need a scale, you can make one. Whereas you can't do that with a digital scale. All right, so in this type of balance, um, we are going to have, I will label, all right, we're gonna label our moment arms, R1, and here we have an F, one, R2, F2, R3, F3. So our torque one is going to be R cross F out of the board, which we denote as if you're looking down an arrow. R2 has the same direction. As R, sorry, at torque two has the same direction out of the board. Torque three into the board. And then we're gonna draw a coordinate system so that we know um, when in doubt, I like to use what I call the standard coordinate system. Z is pointing out at you because you need a right-handed coordinate system. You need X hat cross Y hat equals Z hat. Um, and then that's pointing towards you. All right, now we can write our torques. So our first torque, um, the net torque is going to be R1 at the magnitude of R1 F1 in the Z hat, positive Z hat direction plus R2 
f2 in the z hat direction minus r. Oops, instinctively, I'm putting a um, putting an arrow over it because I want to make it a ver vector. R3 F3 Z hat. Okay, so if you knew two of the masses, you could calculate the other. Um, this all has to be zero. So in this case, because your torques are all in the same direction, they're in either positive or negative Z hat. So, um, <clears throat> So you get one equation out of your torque. Um, you would have to know two masses to know the other mass. But then you can get to where you know it pretty well. All right. Um, and this is a free body diagram for a meter stick um, where you're attaching different weights. It's the same idea. Um, you would have, we use our standard coordinate system, the, um, the torques in this direction. Um, so in the torques on the left-hand side of the pivot point are going to be in the positive Z direction and the torques from weights on the right hand side are going to be in the negative z direction. So um, here, your torque is all going to be in the z direction. So I'm going to have a big, um, a big bracket. You have RW plus R1, W1, plus R2, W2, minus R3, W3, all in the Z hat direction. So in this case, you were asked to find W3. So you set it all equal to zero, and you would have to know weights one and two. And then um, you can get that W3 is equal to RW plus R1, W1 plus R2, W2 all over R. So you can solve exactly for that. All right, another application. You have a forearm that is rotated around your elbow. Um, and the contraction of the muscle causes tension. Um, OK, so here you would, this is breaking this into its different components. <laughs> In this case, uh, different x and y axis chosen than our standard x and y. So you're actually showing the torque around the elbow using the bicep as the x direction. And in this case, the torque created by the weight is not exactly lined up in the bicep with the bicep, so you have to um, calculate something different. Same idea. Um, you are looking at torques from the different weights. You get one. Um, you get a tension from the, um, <clears throat> if we go back here, um, you have the elbow in the corner. You have torques about, um, about the elbow. Um, you can have a torque from the uh, elbow and a torque from the bicep and a torque from the mass. Okay, another example is a ladder on the wall. Um, in this case, uh, you have a normal force of the floor on, let me use the spotlight, a normal force of the floor on the ladder. 
Um, <clears throat> and you also have a force due to friction um, that is due to, um, th that is from the ladder being stuck against the wall. The ladder acts like a mass at its center of mass, which is probably in the center of the ladder. You also, you have the wall, the ladder leaning against the wall. So there is a normal force of the ladder, of the wall against the ladder. So one thing to notice, and here you can see that in the solutions, there's a highlighted, there's a coordinate system. Um, it is a good idea to always explicitly write your coordinate system. At the beginning, you think of this as writing this down for the instructor and to find the solution. But the big secret is that you're writing this stuff down for you so that when you go back to study for an exam, you can make some sense out of it. Um, I already understand this type of problem. You're writing this stuff down for you so you can figure it out. <laughs> All right, so you would, um, you can write, um, you can choose your favorite pivot point along here. Um, and then you write a torque about that pivot point. So if you choose this as your pivot point, then let me, let me go through here. Um, if I stick with the coordinate system there, my Z is out of the, um, is out of the board. Um, I have no torque about this point from this or this because the moment arm is zero. So that makes it easy. So if I write down my net torque, my net torque is going to be the distance to the center of mass times the weight of the ladder and then times the sine, because it's R cross F of the angle between them. And this angle should also be beta. And this is my moment arm. So if this is my moment arm, Then here, this is also pi over two minus beta. And the sine, well, I really also am at, I'm after the component perpen, that is perpendicular to the moment arm. So I can also use a cosine of beta. So cosine beta, and then this is going to be in the negative z hat direction because r cross z hat is into the board. Or sorry, r cross w is into the board. And then for the second one, this is what I have for the moment arm r cross f. So it's out of the board. So plus the moment arm has length L and then the normal force. Is, oh, and I need to have uh, one more thing. I need to have, I'm looking for the component of this force perpendicular to the moment arm, which is now sine beta. All right, and then I can move on to my net force. <laughs> my net force is equal to, 
10 y hat minus m g y hat plus the force of friction in the positive x hat direction minus the force of the wall oh i actually to stick with the notation that is used in the figure i should call this guy f um not normal it's the normal force of the wall on the um on the ladder but this calls it f so i should stick with that notation f x hat and this all has to equal zero so from my x components if i can get this to recognize there we go from my x components i get that f equals f and so the frictional force is equal to the normal force on the from the wall and n equals mg so the frictional force also is going to have at its maximum a magnitude of mu sub s the static coefficient <clears throat> with the normal force So now I know what this force is, and I can plug it back in there. So I could can solve this for the largest angle beta that will let the ladder not slip, assuming it has no one on it later in the in the homework there's a problem where you actually have a person on it and then you have to consider an additional torque now note you actually could choose any point along the ladder and have the torque act along that point it is convenient if you choose one of the points where a force is applied because then you do not have to um then the torques around that point from that force are zero. And anytime you can choose your coordinate system and make stuff zero, you have created less work for yourself. But I could actually pick any given pivot point because everywhere I go, there's no net torque. Um, and my net force equations are gonna be the same either way. All right. So this is somewhat an extension of stuff that we have done before. You write, you look at the problem and you write a net torque and a net force, and then you solve from there. It's not quite, I can say plug and chug, but it's not mindless chugging. You have to actually work through it piece by piece. Okay, so now here you have a vertical door, a, a door which is swinging by, two vertical hinges. Okay, so you actually, you have um, force equations where you have a uh, force from each of the two springs, or sorry, the two hinges. Let me grab my spotlight here. So you have, um, you can, the center of mass is here, it is, convenient to write it as torques about the center of mass um, because you then have some weight and you then can calculate the torque about the center of mass um, but now you have non-zero um, not everything is perpendicular 
you could choose any point. Um, so the door is not going to rotate this way or that way. And then you can, um, but each hinge is going to have some force that it reacts on. You are gonna need a net um, force and, and a net torque. And that's the basic idea. Here you have someone hanging from a scaffolding. This one is somewhat easier. Um, now I have, ooh, I don't wanna use yellow, yellow 